So we've taken a look at the basic activities for the purchase and payment process. Now we want to think about what are the key business rules that we want to follow. So if we look at the table, and it's right there in the chapter, for the example company, we can think about the key activities and steps that are performed as part of this process. So we start with placing our order. All right. Now, what's the objective? Well, we want to order our products from reliable suppliers for good prices and for the required delivery time. So these are the key objectives that we want to meet for placing the order. Now we also have some authorization that we want to consider as well. So in this case, anytime we have an amount greater than $5,000, we need management approval. And again, uh, from a separation of duties standpoint, we don't want the person ordering the products to be managing the inventory records. So inventory control separate from the ordering process. So how do we handle that from an access standpoint? So let's take a look over here in the access. Well, anybody preparing that purchase order should not be able to modify the inventory control records. So they're not going to be writing off inventory as obsolete. They're not going to be uh, changing inventory counts based on um, physical counts, etc. They won't also won't be receiving the items or paying the suppliers. So we've got good separation of duties that we want to consider as far as the various purchasing and payment activities. Finally, from an application standpoint, well, what is the actual AIS going to be able to do? Well, we want to have some kind of a control over the purchase order numbers. Generally, they have some kind of a format. It may be PO dash and then, you know, six numeric digits the system should be able to take whatever format is put in place and just start uh, sequentially assigning purchase order numbers. Default values uh, for various items, we may have a preferred purchase quantity for our various vendors. So the default value goes to uh, say 100 items from the vendor. And then we're going to have range and limit. Of course those default values can be changed. Uh, range and limit checks so we can see, you know, what if for some reason there's a keystroking error, you know, someone types in the wrong number, 10 million instead of uh, 100,000. So things like that can be useful in the system itself. And then, of course, the system should create a solid audit trail for the entire process. All right, so let's go to now receiving the items. So the items are coming in. The order has been placed, the items come in. So the key objective there is we want to make sure that the record of receiving the goods is uh, entered promptly and accurately. Again, the person receiving the items should not be the same person ordering the items. So receiving should be separate from the ordering process. Also, uh, the receiving person should not be able to actually go in and make any changes to the original purchase order or and again also to the inventory records uh, as a matter of fact they probably shouldn't even be able to see the items the number of items ordered in the purchase order uh, this is called a blind copy of the purchase order yeah they can see which items they're expecting but not the quantity that were ordered this helps prevent basically someone trending toward whatever the uh, number ordered was. I count, you know, a thousand items and I got 999. Well, you know, they ordered a thousand. I must have skipped one. I'll just go ahead and check off a thousand here. So the count should be completely free of bias. And then application controls. Well, you want the system to only allow the receiving partner to enter the number of items received uh, again, we'll have range and limit checks on those quantities. Uh, and we also want to make sure that the date defaults to the current date uh, for this type of activities. Uh, you want to receive uh, and record that promptly, so we uh, expect that every good received was received on the current date. And this helps prevent the possibility of backdating or entering the wrong date by mistake. Now, 
it's time to assess the items. Basically, we're going to put the items through their quality assurance check, the QA check. So now we're going to see, uh, are any of the items that came in not of the quality that we expect? So we want to reject the defects and then record those items that we've accepted. Now, here we have uh, the same type of authorization. We want the person assessing. Should, can't be the same. Well, I guess I didn't really type that in very well. But basically, you want the person assessing the items to be different than the ones ordering the items. Can't be same. So we'll just scratch out should. Assessor of the items can't be the same as the person who ordered the items. And again, here we've got the assessor. We don't want them to be able to modify the purchase orders or the inventory records. And from an application control standpoint, we only want to allow the person making the assessment to have access to that part of the receiving application. And again, the date's going to default to the current date to help prevent erroneous data entry. So we're halfway through. Let's take a look at the next step. We're going to now, we've assessed our items and taken those that are in good shape, passed them along. Now we can place them in inventory. So here we want to make sure we put everything in the proper location. So most companies and most warehouses have different locations that have been assigned to different uh, items or different goods. Again, we want the person placing the items into inventory should be different, must be different than the person ordering the goods. Again, they can't modify the purchase orders and the system should specify the location for each of the inventory items. So that's how the system is going to help determine where the various items go. Warehouse planning comes into play here along with the size and weight of various items and uh, how much space they take up. So the various in, uh, warehouse bins can be allocated appropriately. All right, next, return defective items. All right, so we've got defective items that we uh, may have identified. So we want to make sure we get those returned promptly so that we can get any kind of credit we uh, want to for them and don't have to tie up uh, any cash, uh, paying a receivable or a payable that uh, uh, sh we shouldn't pay. Uh, again, we probably want to have manager approval for these types of returns and maybe a management uh, verification or inspection of those items to make sure, yes, indeed, they are defective. Uh, and a control for that, and this is a fraud control, you want to make sure the person returning the items can't modify the vendor and supplier info. That way you can't uh, change the vendor address to, say, your buddy's address or even your own home address and ship the goods and uh, get some free goods yourself. So you want to make sure that that is a control in place. Uh, and then the application control here, well, basically the system is going to provide the supplier address so that uh, the person returning the items doesn't have a chance to just key it in from scratch. All right, and then finally, let's pay the supplier. And these are just examples of some of the business rules. Uh, obviously, there would be more business rules uh, in a full-blown system, but this gives you a feel for some of the things you want to think about. All right, so we're paying the supplier. So, of course, we want to make sure we make an accurate payment and take the discount if it's advantageous to it to us or if we've got the cash available and again just from a separation of duty standpoint whoever makes the payment must not be the person who ordered received or accepted the items also the person making the payment can't modify purchase orders the receipt records or the acceptance records so we're making sure that each person along the way has access to their little piece of the activity and their portion of the audit trail, but they're not going to be able to go back and change other pieces of the audit trail. And same thing, the system should, from an application control standpoint, be able to supply the vendor payment info, the amount of where the payment's sent, the amount of the payment, and again, the date will default to the current date, so we don't have the possibility for miskeying or future dating or backdating.
All right, so business rules, uh, important to consider them each step along the way in a business process. We start with the actual activity itself. You know, what are the various activities in the process? For each activity, what is the key intent? What is management's intent or objective regarding that process? And from there, we can fall into, well, here are the authorizations, here are the controls, both from an access and an application standpoint that need to be put in place.